Today is January the 17th, 2011. This is the start of an interview with Mr. Albert John Fontana at the RSVP offices of Catholic Social Services of Macomb. Mr. Mont Fontana is 89 years old. He was born August the 16th, 1921. Mr. Fontana currently resides at 45201 North Point Boulevard, Utica, Michigan. My name is Dave Brusso and I will be the interviewer and Gary Miglia will be the videographer. Mr. Fontana, would you state for the record the branch of service that you served? I served in the Army. United States Army. All right. May I call you Albert? Sure. <clears throat> I'd like to go back to your last part of your high school career and kind of get you to introduce us to your family at that point and also introduce how you got into the service at that point. Can you remember back then? Well, I graduated from Cash Tech High School which is one of the finest schools in Detroit. Yes, it is. And uh, I began working for Excel Corporation oh. when I got out of high school. What were you doing there? I was a tool grinder, tool maker. How big was your fam family? We had uh, mother and dad and Two daughters, two sisters, and myself. Where were you in that mix? I was, I was born first. You were first born. How long did you stay at Excel? I stayed there for twenty-nine years. Twenty-nine years. Twenty-nine years. At that time, they closed five plants and got rid of all the employees. From there I worked, I was out of work for six months. When, when you went to Excel, yes. what point did you get into the service? When I went into Excel, uh, the war wasn't started yet. What year was that, do you remember? In 1941. 19, okay, 1941. And how long were you at Excel before you entered the service? Was there? Hmm, that's a good question. Let's see. You said you went there right out of high school. Yeah, I was 29 years old. Uh, I was there for 29 years. I was there about 27 years before I went into service. <laughs> then I got drafted. Okay, you got drafted. Get drafted. Well, you would have been drafted around 1944. That's right, exactly. And you got out of high school at, when did you get out of high school? 43. 43. Okay, so you you actually were there for about a year, and then you got drafted. Yeah, well, I got uh, a two and a half years of deferment. Oh, you did? Yes, I did. Why did you have deferment? Because uh, they needed me in the shop more than they needed me in the Army. How did you qualify to get into the toolmaker right out of high school? Well, you took that uh, type of work in high school. Cash Tech taught us that. And, and a lot of the stuff that I did in high school, I did in, in the shop. Now, what, what's, what's that job involve as a tool maker? Grinding tools, precision tools. So you probably had access to the machinery at Cast Tech, right? Yes, yes, I did. Okay. When you got finally drafted, yes. did you have a choice as to what you were going to do? I wanted to get in the Navy, but I was colorblind and they wouldn't accept me. 
Army don't take anybody, right? <laughs> hey, Army, <don't> take me. <laughs> they took me. They took me. That's it. It's about anybody you can take. <clears throat> okay. When you got drafted, how did your parents feel about that? Well, they weren't happy about it. At all. I'm sure. This was right toward the end of the war. Well, yes, it was 1944. The end of the war ended in 45. Were, were your parents and you aware how close we were to the end of the war yet? Or no. nobody knew that yet, eh? No. And I suspect there was quite a bit of news and publicity about the war as it was going on at that point. I'm sure that affected the way your parents reacted oh, to sure. you going they, in. They figured it. Who knows if I'll ever come back. Yeah. I didn't even know that myself. How, how did you feel about being drafted? I hated it. Really? It wasn't my cup of tea. Where did they send you right off to boot camp? They sent me to Fort McClellan, Alabama. Had this been the first time you'd have been away from the state of Michigan? No, I've been away. I got married and they went to Niagara Falls. Matter of fact, they gave me only three days furlough. So they wouldn't give me any more than that. And after, I guess, after the three days, I had to go right back to work again. And I was working 10 hours a day, seven days a week then. I assume Excel was providing some Material for the war effort? Oh yes, it was all war. <clears throat> all the material, all the good stuff that was grinding was all war stuff. Tell us a little bit about your boot camp experience. Can you remember about that? Well, it, it was for 17 weeks. And uh, we had to go on bivouac, had to go on walks learn how to shoot a rifle and all that. Any specific experiences you remember that stood out? Mm -hmm. Well, we were out on camp for maybe a week and the fellows were all growing a beard. And the captain didn't like that idea of the fellows being with a beard. So he gathered us and had a meeting. He says, hey, you guys come back in an hour all shaved at night. And so he, after, after an hour, we all lined up. And those that were shaved, they shaved them. Oh. And I, 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 was, I had a clean shave. And they asked me how I did it. <laughs> how, I, how I had such a clean shave. I told them, well, I, put a mirror on a tree and had a flashlight and, and shaved myself. Wow. We were, in, we were out in the country, so it didn't make any difference. How did you find, was there any difficulty adapting to the regimen of the boot camp activities? Did you find that hard to adjust to? Well, a little bit uh, at first it was because you, you had to they tell you how to march and all that, and how to pivot and all that. Well, it's all new to everybody, and, and it takes a little while to catch on to that. So, uh, finally got on to it, and everything worked out all right. Did you, did you meet up with some friends that, that lasted beyond boot camp? No. No? Uh, beyond the marching and the... the shooting the gun, were there any other activities that they got you involved in to train you? Well, I, you shot, I, I shot the mortars, shot machine guns, artillery. You see the picture up there. I've got... Oh! We'll do a close-up on that at the end. I was Remind just me at all. Yeah, that was very good. I'll pick that up. Boy, what a stud. I had two purple hearts. 
Good. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Sure. This is when you you got shot a couple times, right? That's right. That's yeah. Right. When I was overseas. I shot in Germany twice. All right. Did you have a chance to, to have a preference where you were going to be sent? Like to Europe or to no Pacific? Like, no pre preference at all. As a matter of fact, when I was in Europe, after the war in Europe, they were supposed to send us to Japan. So that it did materialize. Yeah, that, that, that was common, yeah. It was, but besides that, I, I knew I wouldn't go because I was already out of commission. Okay, you're finished with boot camp now. Where did they assign you? Well, they sent me uh, a furlough for two weeks, so I came home. From there, I went to Fort Meade, Maryland. When you came home, what was it like after being away for so long? You mean after a discharge? No, no, after boot camp. After boot camp. Well, the people were happy to see me come back. Yeah. Simply because uh, there was so much rationing and the GIs that were coming back, whenever the parent, whenever they came back, the, the parents would take them to the stores and the they put us in front of the line, in front of everybody else. Oh, nice! <laughs> yeah, if you wanted chickens, and then uh, people who were waiting in line, why well, uh, chickens were hard to get then? Yeah. So they take take me by the hand, put me in front of the line, and and get whatever I wanted. Did you have to be in uniform when you did that? <coughs> oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes. You couldn't get out of uniform when you were in service. <clears throat> so how long was your furlough? Two weeks. Two weeks. Where was your wife living when you came back home? She's living with her mother oh. and her parents, and, I, and that's where I was when I went in. And I bought a home after we came back, after I got out of service. Okay, now, <clears throat> you said they took you to, they sent you to where? After your boot Fort camp? Meade, Fort Meade, Maryland. Okay, what was your job going to be there? It, what training were you going to get there? Didn't get any training at all. That was a point of in, embarkation. Oh, so you knew that ahead of time? Oh, sure. <clears throat> Matter of fact, they uh, they uh, put us on a boat called the Eula France, which is a big, which is one of the biggest boats that they have. It must have had about six thousand soldiers on it. Oh boy! It crossed across the Atlantic Ocean all by itself, zigzagging. Took us uh, 11 days to go from across the ocean. What was that experience like? Well, the food was terrible. <laughs> the sleeping quarters was terrible. They had that, uh, what do you call those, um, uh, beds. You tie a, a rope on one side. And one Hammocks? A hammock, yeah. yeah. And, and one on top of the other. It was terrible. Did you get seasick? No, I didn't get seasick at all. Oh boy, I bet a lot of them did. I imagine did. And one of the people that was on that boat was Mickey Rooney. Is that right? Yeah. I never met him, but I heard he played poker with the guys. Was he in the service or he, was he just there to entertain? I think he was in the service. Mm. Yeah. I'll be darned. So you never got a chance to talk to him, or never, never even seen him. I just heard that he was. Yeah. There. <clears throat> okay. So, where did they ship you to specifically? Do you remember? Well, we landed in uh, uh, Scotland. Scotland. Yeah. At the name of the city, we landed. Then mm -hmm. they took us on a train through England, Scotland, to Southampton, England. And then we boarded a boat there across the English Channel. And we stayed on the boat for about two days because there were so many people coming off the boat at the same time. And there were so many obstacles in the water that uh, made it hard to get through. This wasn't D-Day invasion, was it? Oh, no. This was, uh, they landed there about the 28th of November, mm -hmm. <clears throat> about three months after the D-Day. Okay. Oh, it was after D-Day already. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, what was your job there and where did you go from there? 
when we landed in France? Well, they put us on a train, I mean on a, on a truck. They shipped us across France and they, we were near the Belgian border. What was your job then? Uh... Just a common job. As a matter of fact, they, uh, there were six of us in a tent. And some guy poked his head through the tent. Says we need uh, three volunteers for KP. And there were three sergeants and three uh, three privates in there. And I was a private. So the sergeant said, you, you, and you. You volunteer. Best job I ever had. Opening up cans of pineapple, cutting bread, fresh bread. And I love pineapple. Mm -hmm. So I had my share. <laughs> had my share. So at that point, you're just a gun-toting troop. That's all. That's all. I was in the infantry, and my job was to carry a rifle. Matter of fact, when we went there, we didn't have a rifle. They gave us a rifle when we got there, and and uh, the, the rifle was full of cosmoline. And it well, uh, washed the cos, take the cosmoline off the rifle in the rain along the river. <coughs> what a miserable. Day. What a miserable day, a miserable job taking cotton off, off a rifle in the rain. Did you get assigned to certain projects where you had to go out uh, to fight the enemy? No. no. No? So you were safely tucked away in the... Until they decided where to put me. <clears throat> It wasn't long after that. Yeah, we were there about two weeks, I guess. And after that, they uh, took us and they brought us near the front line. And uh, they selected you, you, and you come with me. And that's how I got assigned to the 104th Infantry Division. When when did you learn you don't volunteer for anything in the service? <laughs> At the beginning. <laughs> Learn real fast. They, they want volunteers for truck drivers. They give you a wheelbarrow yeah. to, to push things around, pick up stuff and put stuff away. Oh boy. Stuff like that. They, they, <laughs> they're conniving. When, when you get out toward the front line, what, what was the food like? We had K rations. Is, is that the stuff we used to see? Spam? Well, no, I think uh, Spam was a sea ration. Yeah. And it can. Yeah. And and uh, K ration was in the package. Oh. The package contained a uh, uh, little chocolate bar, bitter sweet chocolate bar, and a pack of three cigarettes, toilet paper, and whatever the food was in it. Mm hmm So how would you eat that? Just Right out of the package, or you could eat it out of the package, or if you had time and you had the heat, you could heat it. Would you use your helmet? No, no. Some of them turn the helmet upside down, fill it with water, and no, 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 never did. That. No, never did that. And when you had a helmet on, you had a, a helmet liner in it. <clears throat> I just keep my toilet paper in the helmet liner. Oh yeah. Whenever they need toilet paper, they come to me. Everybody say, Al, oh, you got any toilet paper? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess these guys never saved toilet paper. Mm. So I got stuck saving the only way paper. probably to keep it from being wet, eh? I, absolutely. Yeah. It, it was better than this. In the helmet liner, there's a, uh, uh, like, um, like this. And on top of that, you store, straps. Your, store your stuff in there. Maybe kind of straps, you can strap yeah, it in? straps yeah. inside the helmet liner. That Save the paper from falling out. Or if you had a, um, what do you call these packs, life saving packs on your back. They put my mail and stuff like that in. Oh, yeah. Backpacks? Backpack, yeah. Uh, they had. Uh, How much gear did you have to carry around with you? Well, I just uh, had my ammunition. With a rifle and hand grenades, maybe three or four hand grenades. That's about it. Stationary I had in my helmet. 
tell me about your your first encounter with being shot. You remember about that? Well, the first encounter I was wasn't really shot. It was a uh, we, we were on an outpost and a standing guard with this other guy, and we were bombed by our own plane. Oh. And uh, the guy that was with me he got a broken arm and a broken leg. And uh, I don't know what happened to me because I was all full of sand and dust and all that. And the, and the next thing I know, I was in the basement of this house. No top, and just the bottom of the house, the basement, with people, uh, civilians in it. And the guy had me on a bed, on a table, flexing my arm. He says, you're, you're all right. I says, how did I get here? And the guy says, well, you were walking out there in the days. I got you by the hand and brought you in the basement. Wow. So wonder I didn't step on any mines or anything like that, or somebody German shooting me. What happened to some of the soldiers that were with you at the time? Well, there were about 20 of them got hurt and three died, three got killed. Well, this is in Indian Germany, right by the Indian River, I-N-D-I-N-D-E, in. So where did you, where did they put you after, after being in the uh, bottom of this house foundation? Well, they, they took us by uh, truck to a hospital in Belgium, in the Liège, Belgium, Buzz Bomb Alley, they called it. The uh, Germans would shoot their buzz bombs over Liège on our way to, on our way to England. The funny part was that they, the English and the Americans learned how to manipulate the uh, buzz bombs. They get their the buzz bomb would go a certain speed and the plane would go match the speed and get the wing and flip it. So the buzz bomb wouldn't go to England, it would land in the water in the English Channel. I'll be darned. So that way the people would <laughs> save a lot of lives that way. Yeah. And when you saw the buzz bomb, you didn't know where it was going to go. Oh, I knew it was going to England. <clears throat> but you can you can hear it coming by. I don't remember whether I could see it or not. Hmm. It pretty high. But I was in a hospital in Belgium for maybe three weeks. And then, they, and then from there, they uh, sent us to uh, Paris for about a week. Recuperation? Recuperate, and then they sent us back to the front line again. When when you were in the basement, were you were you feeling any pain from, what'd you take, a, a shrapnel hit? No, no, I was just, uh, I had cuts and bruises on my hands. And it, it, it had blood. But uh, actually, I, I was more or less shell shot. Well, I didn't get any cuts. I didn't get nothing serious, but... Uh, what was it like in the hospital? Well, there were a lot of guys there that uh, got wounded. I could see uh, when I got in there, there were boots in the corner where they'd taken the boots off the guys that were there. And you must have piles of them. Mm. The, thing, the thing is, they had combat boots and when, and when you got out of the hospital, they gave you leggings. And, and the guys that were in the front line, the guys that were in the, uh, in the rear, they had combat boots. And we had leggings and we were in combat. We didn't think that, I didn't think that was right. They were the ones who should wear the leggings and we should wear the combat boots. Yeah. Actually, when we were in combat, we never did take our boots off. Even when at night, when you slept. Because uh, if the Germans counterattacked, you don't want to fool around putting your boots on. Yeah. You want to take off in a hurry. Did you ever see any of the enemy? Did you ever see any Face enemy? to face? The enemy? Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, uh, when we were in Durham, before we prepared to cross the Royal River, mm -hmm. one of the Germans surrendered, came across the river, and we, and we were writing letters home. All of a sudden, this German appeared. So we captured him. Huh. 
and, and I says, uh, check them out. And they found a 25 pistol in his, in, in his pocket with a bullet lodged in the chamber. So we took it away from him and he said, what do we do with them? We'll bring them to the rear. So he took them to the quarters where the lieutenant and captains were. And he finally got this guy to go with him across the Royal River and gave him a lot of information of what was going on out there, mm -hmm. which was very helpful. Was he pretty young? Beg pardon? Was he pretty young? Well, I would say he was... Uh, Probably your age? Or, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I'd say about 20. Probably scared, just like you were, huh? Well, <laughs> if you weren't scared, you were lying. Yeah. Were you scared most of the time you were there? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I was hoping yeah. I'd ever I'd come back home someday. But <laughs> a lot of guys never did come back yeah. home. Did, did somebody contact your family to tell them that you were in the hospital? The first time the government did. I knew my wife was a nervous type of a woman. Mm -hmm. So the government notified them. The second time I got wounded, because I got a story to tell you on that one. Okay. <laughs> now the second time I got wounded, I was in the hospital. Uh, they took me to the hospital in England. Maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I was in the hospital in England, and I, and I called the nurse over and I said, hey, will you, bring, will you have a uh, gray lady come in? I want to dictate a letter to her. So she said, sure. So finally the gray lady came, and I dict started dictating a letter to this gray lady. The gray lady is just like a Red Cross lady in England. So I dictated this letter to her, and the more I dictated, the more she, she started crying. The more I dictated, the more she cried. I said, well, I've had it. So I finished the letter, and I, I told the, the next day I told the nurse, bring me a checkerboard, bring me four thumbtacks, bring me some paper and a pencil. I had my right arm in, in broken, and I couldn't write right, I'm right hand, I couldn't write. So I, she says, well, that's a bad, uh, odd combination. What are you going to do with that? I said, I'll show you. So I had one, this leg was in the traction, this arm was in traction. So I propped the checkerboard on my legs. I took the paper, put it on the checkerboard, thumbtack on each corner so the paper wouldn't move, and I started printing left-handed. I made sure every note was right. And that's how I wrote to my wife and I told her, I'm wounded, I'm in a hospital. I told her what had happened so she wouldn't be, too, and don't be too worried because I'm all right. And that's, she, she got the letter before the government got to her. Mm -hmm. So she was, at least she, she wasn't <clears throat> surprised as to the note. Yeah. How, how did the government contact the families? I don't know how they do it. They, they, they find out who got wounded and they know where they live and they got their address and they... They send them a telegram? A telegram, yeah. Yeah, that's the way it's in the movies. Yeah, that's the way they did it. Almost... Everybody I can remember when I was young dreaded getting that guy from the... Oh, yeah. What the heck was the name of the place? Uh, Western Union, maybe? Yeah. Western Union, yeah. Might have been the post office or Western Union. Yeah. And you'd get this guy coming up with... Oh, you scared. Or if there was a death, it could have been two uniformed... Soldiers. Soldiers that would come up. Yeah. That's bad news. Yeah. Yeah. That's the last thing you want to see. Uh, how did you get wounded the second time? Well, the second time we were in combat and uh, <clears throat> the guys that were ahead of us, got, a lot of them got hurt and wounded. So our squad was intact. And there was 12 guys in the squad. So they says to me, Al, you'll be first scout. Scout ahead of everybody else. And so. Take the point. Said, take the point, yeah. So anyway, I seen that walk by as a machine gun on this, on this dugout. 
I looked in that hole where the guys were in there. Didn't see anything. So I walked over to a little bit further and there was another machine gun. Same way. Looked in the hole and didn't see anybody. Walked by a little bit further and I heard Germans talking in, a, in this hole. Another, another machine gun. So I, I motioned for them to come out. Well, three of them came out. So as I walked them towards the second machine gun nest, the Germans were talking, and the, the guys that were in there, in there, they came out. There's three more, There's six. I walked to the first one, and they heard the Germans talking. Three more come out. There's nine Germans I had captured. So the guy says, oh, what do you do with these guys? Says, Take them back. Take them back to the rear. I took them back and came back and proceeded on. All of a sudden, the machine gun started opening fire on us. The guy next to me started shooting at him. Shot once. He started shooting back at him with the machine gun. I heard he got hit through the head, head killed. And he started picking on me. Well, then I tried to play dead because I couldn't shoot against the machine gun. So um, they shot me in the leg first. In the leg, along the knee, and all, through the foot. I could feel my boot was full of blood. Mm. Wow. Can I keep going? <coughs> so anyway, they kept shooting at me and reloading and all that. And they, they shot maybe about a couple hundred round, rounds at me. And I was poised, ready to shoot back at them, and uh, they shot their rifle right out of my arm. I was posed like this, and they shot me right through the arm, broke my arm. So then I, they stopped shooting. So then I got, I got up, I got a whole hell of my arm like this, because I knew it was broken. Turned around and it fell flat on my face. Wow. And then, and, and then the medic came and took care of me. They, they said they thought I was dead. Well, thank God. And, and the funny thing is that while I, while I was laying there, I said, sick of my, I was married two years before I went in service. You know how things come into your mind? Mm -hmm. I said to myself, I guess I'll never become a father. Mm -hmm. I think I was going to make it. I got one there. She was the first one. Now, Anyway, were you feeling a lot of pain at that time? Absolutely. Yeah. But I, but I was happy to get out of there. And the thing is that uh, they, they they put me on a stretcher, and they're going to put me on top of a jeep, which would be the uh, Red Cross wagon uh, ambulance. And at, at that time, these guys that were shooting at me surrendered. They were out ammunition. <laughs> So, one guy was about close to 30, and the other two were kids, about 12 years old. Wow. All in uniform. So, while I, while I was on the, uh, on the stretcher, I asked one of the stretcher bearers, give me your pistol. Huh. Well, give me the pistol. You knew what I was going to do. I'm not left-handed, but I'll shoot the pistol left-handed. <laughs> He wouldn't give me the pistol. Anyway, they surrendered, and uh, they took them back to the rear. They took me to the uh, uh, temporary hospital in the tent, and they put me in a semi-temporary uh, cast. And I was from there, they put me in a plane and shipped me to England. I was in England in the hospital uh, for about a month, and they were closing the hospital, so then I had to get out of the hospital there and put me on a ship and they shipped me to see what was it, Boston. Was this near the end of the war now at this point? Well at that time it was, um, let's see, the end of the war was in, uh, no, in May, wasn't it? Yeah, May of 45. Yeah, and uh, I was wounded in March of 45. Yeah, it was close to the end of the house. Yeah, when, mm -hmm. when, the, when the war ended, I think I was in in England. No, I mean, in, uh, yeah, in England, that's where it was. The uh, European war in, in Europe ended, and I was in England. Uh, so. 
Mm -hmm. And they shipped me to Boston, and I stayed in Boston for about a week. From there, they shipped me to uh, uh, Fort, no, 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 the hospital in Iowa, Clinton, Iowa, Chick General Hospital. I stayed there about six months. I had that long, huh? I had two surgeries there. Then I was getting on my feet better, and then they shipped me to uh, uh, Florida. I had a choice of either Florida, Colorado, or Battle Creek. Battle Creek had amputees, and I didn't want to go with amputees. Colorado was in the wintertime, it was in February, and it was snowing, and I, and I figured, well, Florida would be the ideal. <laughs> so, so I went to Florida for a, a month. What kind of damage did the did the shooting cause to your shoulder? Well, they, I had when I was in the hospital in, in uh, Iowa, they had me uh, in a uh, whirlpool treatment. They stick my whole arm in there, and then after about half an hour in there, then they get it out, and then the, the girl, the nurse, would massage it. See, I. I my arm was like this for six months. Wow. So you get calcium deposits in your elbow. Yeah. Well, when, when, they had, when they had my arm in a cast in England, no, before they put it in a cast, they had, they had my arm like this. And they, they drilled a hole in my elbow. And they put a pin in, in, in the elbow with a, like a horseshoe shaped thing with a, a line running to the foot of the bed, down the foot of the bed, on a pulley. And then about the end of the pulley, they had a bag of, a, of um, weights. And that would keep the bone apart, keep the, keep the bone here apart, so, that, so it would mend, and the particles of bone would come back again. And it was that way for a while. And that's why I, I couldn't use this arm here at all. That's how I, I wrote left handed. My biggest battle, the biggest battle I was in was uh, enduring. If I came back, I was wounded the first time. We had every, uh, the 4th of July was a piece of cake here compared to what we had. We had, from, for 45 minutes, we had all kinds of fire, tanks, mortars, machine guns, you name it shooting across the way to the Germans. If they lived, they were fortunate. And a lot of them were sh shell shot. And when we had, we, before we went into the battle there, or we, we used to go in the back and uh, practice paddling bo uh, boats or rafts across the river. So that when they crossed the Roar River, why we knew what we were gonna do. But it just so happened that uh, at that time, the Germans had dams that were were intact. We tried to catch them before they broke the dam so the water wouldn't go down. And uh, we failed to catch them in time. Well, they broke the dams and what roar, roar was a little stream to begin with. And it was a huge lake when we got done and it was real swift. When we paddled, we started at uh, one area, and uh, the, the raft would end up about a quarter of a mile down the stream. And the Germans would shoot artillery at us and machine guns, and pierce the boats and, and, and the drafts and the rafts, and sink them. And the water was so swift that the, the, the rafts would turn around in the water. And at the end of this, at one end of the Roar River was a dam, it was a a fall where it would end and come down like that. And the bridge was uh, there was a bridge over uh, where it used to be a railroad track was down and the cement was down there. A lot of these guys would grab onto the get down that far and then they grab onto the steel girders from the from the bridge, save themselves from drowning. And a lot of them didn't know about it, and some of them jumped off before they got to it, saved themselves, and others didn't, and they drowned. Could you swim? No. So that must have been awfully scary for you, huh? Oh, yeah. And matter of fact, 
when they put me in a boat on, a, on this raft, he says, engineer, there was supposed to be an engineer for each raft in there. There was no engineer. He says, you're the engineer. So, so he says, when you get out on the other side, you jump out of the raft, grab the rope, and pull us in the shore. Okay, so we were fortunate enough not to get hit by any machine gun or anything. We, we paddled across, and luckily we landed where the water was shallow. I, I jumped out of the boat, out of the raft. The raft rope tangled around my feet and dragged me in the water, and it was cold. <laughs> I'll tell you, my butt was freezing. <laughs> And then I pulled them in. I had a machine. I had an ammunition belt. And at that time, I was—I'm I, not a smoker, but I was smoking while I was in service. I had five packs of palm oil in my in, in my uh, oh. belt, and they all got wet. And I had to throw them all away. Mm. But then, then, then again, uh, they had mined the area that we were supposed to land on, that we were going to land on. But the water was so swift that it washed the. Uh, dirt off of mine so you could see them where they were at. And uh, we made sure that we didn't step on any mines. And we took that durn so fast that our unit received a distinguished unit citation. Were there any opportunities for the soldiers to get entertainment of any kind as a diversion from the fighting? Yeah, they had... Um, when we got relieved, they sent us to the, in, to the rear, and they had big band playing their music, and they did have a group of little guys being entertained. So that was where some of those entertainers would come? Yeah, wait. Well, one other thing I forgot to tell you. When I was in the hospital in England, I raked to my wife telling her I was in the hospital in England and that what hospital was that and where was that. And she would talk to the girl next door. And together they would say, well, my husband is in England too. He's in the hospital. He got wounded. So lo and behold, we were in the same hospital. And one day I was sitting in a, on my cot with my back turned towards this guy and the guy tapped me on the shoulder and turned on. My next door neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> small, small world. What are you doing? Something. What are you doing here? It's the same thing you are. He got well. He was in a tank car. He got shrapnel in uh, in his uh, heel. He says they're having a movie shortly. You want to go see a movie? And he had to wheel me in the wheelchair to get to it. So we went and seen the movie together. Small world. Yeah. How? How did your mother handle you being wounded two times? Well, I wasn't living with my mother. I was living with my mother-in-law. But she took it like any other mother would take it, I guess. My dad, when I came home, my dad, I was the first time I seen my dad cry. Mm. He saw me, and my wife says, you look like an old man when you came home. You know, I, I've heard that before from another source source that we interviewed. The wife was there at the interview and she said he, he just looked terrible and he looked 10 or 15 years older. Yeah, well, I was in a cast in an arm like that and, it, and, and it was, it, the cast was far enough from my chest that she was thin enough that she fit in there and we would dance. <sighs> I'll be done. Yeah. Thank God we didn't fall. <laughs> have, you, have you regained full use of your arm? Well, yeah. Uh, this, I don't have this all the way straight, and then I, there are things I can't do with it anymore. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I played golf with these guys. I used to play golf with all the time. I used to beat them all the time. And when I came home in a, in a cast and went to work, I went to go where I worked and then I saw these guys again. And when I got discharged, he says, well, you know how Al is when he had his arm like that? He can't play golf like he used to. I played golf and I beat him again. He says, we're not giving him any strokes, he's giving us strokes. <laughs> now, when 
you're in my you're in Florida. Yes. Did you get discharged from Florida? Is that no? From Florida, they sent me to Illinois, Chicago. That's where I got discharged, Fort Sheridan. How did you feel about that? Uh, I was in heaven. I was there three days. I couldn't wait to get discharged. What's the hang-up? Well, I was getting disability then. He started giving me the, he needed all, this, uh, all the information he needed. Excuse me. Get all the information to uh, give me a disability. He started me off at 100% disability for six months. And he wanted me to go get checked by another doctor. And I got checked by another doctor. He felt that I didn't need it 100%. So they gave me 60%. So that's what I'm getting now. Oh, you're still getting it, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, but darn. So uh, how did you get home when, when when you were discharged? Did they give you money to take a train? Well, I was in I was in Chicago at the time. Yeah, you got discharged. And I had money to get to Detroit. I was living in Detroit. So I took the train and came home. And, I, and I, there's another guy with me. Mm -hmm. We we uh, hired a taxi cab, and that's how I got home. Did your family know that you were coming home at that point? Oh yeah, I yeah. called. I called. I bet your wife was glad to see you, eh? Oh, I guess she was. <laughs> you know, another thing happened now. Uh, well, I was in the hospital in Iowa. It was near Sweetest Day, I think. And I told the nurse I would like to go to the PX and get get a, a, a card to send to my wife. And I says I need a wheelchair because I I can't use a crutches, got one arm or something. Can't walk. I can't use a cane. I have to have a wheelchair. So she wheeled me to the PX. Well, it just so happened the PX was in another building, so you go through the building that you're at and go out the door, go down the ramp, and then you go up the ramp to, to the next building, and and, and uh, the door, you, you couldn't open the door unless somebody opened it for you. Well, the nurse had me in the wheelchair, and, was, and she says, uh, we'll wait here until someone opens the door for us. Okay, so we waited, we waited, we waited, and nobody showed up. So I said, I, I got an idea, I'll tell you what we'll do. You wheel me by the door. I'll hop out of the wheelchair, as bad as I was. I'll hop out of the wheelchair, I'll open the door for you. You wheel the wheelchair in, and then I'll hop in the wheelchair on the other side of the door. Okay, so that's what we did. In the meantime, here comes a doctor and three nurses, and the doctor says, Boy, I've seen everything now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So, uh, how much were you disabled when you got home? Did you have use of the arm at that point, or...? I could walk, but I had to have a cane. Uh-huh. I had the use of my arm, yeah. And then, uh, after I got discharged, I think it was less than a week, I went back to work. And when, they, when I went back to get my job back, he was waiting for me. The guy says, uh, most of the guys that get out of the service, they spend about a month home before they come back to work. I says, look, I've been in the hospital for one year, and I'm so tired of doing nothing, I, I want to go back to work. So he says, um, all right, how soon can you start this? Right away. Would you be interested in a nickel raise? A nickel raise, eh? and it was 10 cents from the top, and the wages were frozen, so, so they gave me a nickel raise out of a nickel from the top. Mm -hmm. Were you able to do the same job <clears throat> that you were doing when you left? Yes. I was a grinder standing up. And that, your disabilities weren't? Didn't affect my work at all. Really? Maybe it wasn't as fast as it was. Yeah. And you would have been gone about three years, huh? A good two years. Yeah.
Were, were you able to pick up your job just like yes. before, or did it take a while to adjust? I did it right away. You know what I told my superintendent? I says, well, I was overseas. I was thinking, I'd rather do the hardest job you guys got than be where I'm at. And I, and I said, one day I, had, I did have, have the hardest job, but I, well, I wasn't sorry that I did it. Turned out all right. What was the hardest job? Zero handy, zero tolerance. It was, you know what, your hair is three thousandths in diameter. You take that hair, split it in three, and it's one thousand, right? Now you take that one thousand hair and you split it in ten. That's one tenth. That's my tolerance. You can't even see one tenth. No. I was making uh, uh, roaches for the jet planes. I was making uh, uh, dovetail form tools for making boats. You name it. As a matter of fact, my daughter was in Germany for four years with her husband. And when she came back one day, she says, Dad, I met some friends of mine. You'll never know where they're from. They're, they, she says, they're from Rhode Island. I says, well, I, I used to do some work for Rhode Island. Wouldn't be Woonsocket, Rhode Island, would it? She, yeah, that's, that's the city that they're from. They're from Woonsocket, Rhode Island. I made a ton of tools for them. Hundreds and hundreds of them. Was there that much work when you got back now that the war was over? No, we used to make them by the hundreds. Then we started making them one and two at a time. That would be the whole job, one and two pieces. We used to make a maybe a hundred piece job, all the same. You, you probably were working on different kind of machinery, di different type of um, military machines. Well, I worked on, on the surface grinders. They had seven. No, I mean the parts. Oh, yes. They were probably supplying parts to uh, oh, you name prop it. driven planes, and now you come back, you're probably supplying parts for the newest jets they had. Well, for the newest jets and for the automobiles, too. That's right. The auto industry started back up again. Exactly. Was that started when you got back? I don't remember what. I imagine it was. Yeah, it was. 46, I think there were 19. I think they stopped making cars in 19. They stopped making early cars 41. in 43. 43? Yeah, because I bought a 40, 41 in 1942. One year old, and in '43 they didn't make any more mm -hmm. until about '46. '46, <clears throat> and and they were they were also full of plastic. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> dashboards and stuff. Yeah, yes, they were artificial. A lot of replacement of the wood and I mean. rubber. I wasn't in the automobile industry, so I couldn't tell you that. My dad worked at for Ford's for 36 years. Well, I can vaguely remember these little green stamps that they gave us to buy food with. Oh, yeah. If you didn't have the green stamp, you couldn't buy tires, you couldn't buy rubber. Yeah, you know, my, my wife, I had a uh, brand new Pontiac. And they needed stamps to buy gasoline with. Yeah. Well, my, you 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 get you buy gasoline, they give you stamps, and you put them in a book, and you get redeem them for something. Well, my wife was looking for a gas station that gave these stamps. She ran out of gas. <laughs> 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 oh boy. Let's let's. Were you ever tempted to use the GI Bill to go to school? Oh yeah, I didn't go to school, but I got a loan from the GI for the first house I, house I got, I bought. For the what? For the first house I bought. Oh yeah. yeah. You remember what you paid for it? Absolutely. Paid seventy-two hundred for it. This is nineteen forty-six. Yeah. What would that house sell for now? Well, I, I had it for seven years, and I sold it for twelve five. 
I'd say it's still there. As a matter of fact, I got a picture of it in the bedroom of the homes I, I, I've owned. That house would probably sell for about today's market of 35000 probably. Mm -hmm. Why did you never take the uh, GI Bill to go to school? Why didn't I? Yeah. Well, I was figuring, I was married. I didn't want to go to school. I wanted to raise a family and uh, make make money to put on the table, food on the table. Probably a good job, too, with Excel. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had a real strong union. That's the whole trouble there. They wanted to break the union, so they did everything they could to break the union. So they finally decided, well, one way to break the union is uh, close the plant. So they did. They closed five plants, got rid of everybody. There was one guy that was working with me, had uh, 49 years seniority. He had one more year to get 50, and, and he got out of there before I did. So they never owned it, opened it up again? No. What did you do then? Well, I was unemployed for about six months, and then after that, my brother-in-law worked uh, for Lettington News, uh, selling uh, books, paperback books. And he got me in there, and I, I, they started me about half of what I was making at Excel, which is well, all right. I was making it up by working overtime. and. Uh, I worked there about nine years. I was making five cents an hour less than the boss was making. Mm. So they told me that when they were going to give raises, I wasn't going to get a raise because I was 50 cents more than everybody else. <laughs> so I said, well, the heck with that noise. I'm, I'm an experienced tool maker. So I looked in the paper and there was about half a dozen ads. So I answered one of the ads. I called up. I said, say, uh, can you use someone about 49 years old? Sure, come on over. So I went over there and they hired me right away. You got your toolbox with you? I said, no, but I can get it. So they hired me and I worked there for about nine years, I think it was. Then things got slow and uh, instead of tools, making tools, they had me cleaning machines. They didn't want to get rid of me because uh, they figured, well, things will pick up. We didn't want to get rid of a skilled grinder, but one of the guys quit that was my buddy and he hired somewhere else. I said, I say, if they need any help over there, let me know. So I got a phone call says, uh, bring your toolbox, we need you. So I went over there and they just started me off at a half an hour, an hour more than what I was making. An hour, and uh, a month later they gave me another half a dollar. <laughs> It's all right. So everything turned out. I was working uh, quite a few hours, doing real well. The first house I the first house I bought I was 29 years old. I had it paid for. The second house I had, well, I sold the first house with a $10,000 land contract. And I had a ten thousand dollar land, ten thousand dollar mortgage on the house I bought. I had built, so I take the money from one house and put it in the other, and plus more. Mm -hmm. And no time at all, I had that house paid for. The last house, I cost me eighty thousand dollars. I paid cash for it. Today, I don't know what it's worth. I still have it. Ranch, ranch home on on a golf course. Where was that located? St. Clair Shores. Oh. St. Clair Shores Golf Course. Oh, that must be right around Little Mac, huh? Yeah, that's far. Yeah? Yeah, I still own it. I've been, I was there 24 years. And you still own that house? Condo. It's a four-family condo. Is, is this the one where you keep all the uh, girlfriends that you were telling me about? I didn't tell you about it. Are you putting words in my mouth? Huh? <laughs> that's where I used to keep all the golf balls. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. Tell us about your awards. Awards. Oh, 
Is that something I can pull off so they can see it? There's just some blue tack on the corners. <clears throat> Is that's going to be my son's. <clears throat> See if you can. Do you need me to hold it? No, I'm just hold on. You good? And one picture shows me uh, at the shop I was working at. I can move it closer. No, you... we're good. Okay. Can okay. you read your rating on there? Um, which, are, are these the two purple hearts? No, one, no, one purple heart. There's only one purple heart. Okay, one. And that was because of your injury, huh? That's right. The two purple hearts. You know, the odd thing is that when I was, I already had one purple heart when I got wounded the first time. The second time when I got wounded, I was in the hospital in England, and the captain came over and wanted to give me a purple heart. I says, I don't want it. He says, why don't you want it? I says, I already got one. I don't want two. What do I want to need two for? All, all I need is a cluster. Well, he got mad because I wouldn't accept the purple heart. <laughs> now, what are some of these other ribbons you got marked down here good conduct distinguished citation what was the distinguished citation for the distinguished citation was to take endurance so fast and that distinguished citation was oh here it is <coughs> mm -hmm. This is a this is a distinguished citation right there. Okay, what was that for? Taking during so fast, capturing during so oh, fast. Oh, oh. And of course, all of these are ribbons which I all these overseas and yeah, uh, rifle, carbine. Oh yeah. Automatic rifle, machine gun, mortar, bayonet. Those are all the weapons that I used. That I was oh, I see your I golf stroke there. Stroke That's a picture of you. I'm um, the golfer there. Golf when I was 10 years old. Until I was 85. Your wife's a very pretty lady. Mm -hmm. There she is there. She looks a little bit like you. Tell what happened when you were doing your hair, doing hair. Just talk about her army. <laughs> she used to be a hairdresser. Mm -hmm. And a lady was, she was doing her hair. And she says, uh, the lady says, to her, I'm going to a party. That's why I'm getting my hair done. She says, well, where are you going? And she told her where she was going. She says, my mother's going to the same party you're going to. Well, what does she look like? She says, look at me and then you'll, you'll <laughs> You'll find her. My wife and I were dancing on the floor, and a lady comes to test my wife's shoulder. Are you Jeannie Fontana's mother? <laughs> yeah. After you got out, did you stay connected with any of your friends in the service or any of the organizations? Yes, I did. <coughs> yes, I did. We, uh, the, first, the first time I got connected with them again, they found me, and uh, they had an annual annual uh, party gathering in uh, Kentucky. Thank you. I forgot the name of the city was. They make bats there. Louisville? Mm -hmm. Fort Knox, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Louisville? 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 Louisville. That's where we had our first meeting. I went there with our first meeting. It was our 50th meeting they had. And they had it uh, for th five days. And they had, you see all your friends that you were with. Your, your friends there were closer than neighbor, than brothers and sisters. Yeah. Depending on you for life, for your yeah. life. Yeah. 
then i then i was in atlanta with him and i was in port see what was a in oregon five different places we were together and i think that this past year is the last year they're going to have it because they had it for sixty five years now and uh... people are dying and diminishing yeah as a matter of fact, I, excuse me, there's something in here underneath all this stuff. Timberwolf. They, they send me this every six months. Oh, is that right? Huh. At Remember Museum. They call it Re Remember Museum. Hummelstown, Pennsylvania. I know where that is. Hummelstown is um, near Hershey, Pennsylvania. Just a little town. So this kind of updates everybody on. They, they well, put you up that's to date pretty on, good on, on, on what's going on, and they even get you the obituary column in there. The people have died uh -huh. in their outfits. Any emails? Well, actually, I didn't get to know too many of those people because I wasn't with them that long. And I, yeah. I came in as a replacement. They call it reinforcement. Well, it's, did you ever have a chance to go back? To visit them? To visit in Germany or well, anywhere? They, they used to go, but uh, now they had less people. Did, did you ever go back? No. No? Yes, you no. did. I could have gone, but if I wanted to. What? You were back in Germany in 1969. I went to Germany, but to visit you, not to uh, visit. I didn't go visit the areas that I fought in. Yes, you did. You went on the I, I, yeah, I said, I, excuse me. I was in Cologne after the war on a vacation for seven weeks. What did it feel like going back to where you were when you were fighting? It didn't bother me at all. No? I was on the Rhine River again for uh, a day on a boat. It was an poor experience. Quite all, see all the mountains and see all the grapevines these people put on the side of the mountains. Yeah. What an experience. Did you ever get back to that river where you froze your butt off? No. On <laughs> <laughs> a Royal River. A Royal River. Yeah, R O A R. No. Is there anything else that you can tell us about your experience that you think we might like to hear? Well, I don't know offhand. I'm sure there's something that I could think of somewhere along the line. What? What? Anybody what, got a question? What? There? What got me was that. Oh, <laughs> what got me was the first day I landed in France. We were in La, in La Havre. There was nothing there. The city was blank. For miles and miles, you could see trees were just no branches and nothing on it. And uh, I just happened to see uh, this civilian walking down the street. And uh, I was talking to him. And I found out he was Italian. So I, I said to him, you speak Italian? He, he says, yes. I says, what do you do here? He said, I'm a barber. And all of a sudden, I got these other guys that were buddies of mine that were with me. Yeah. Ask them where the girls are. Where are the girls? I says, where are the girls at? He says, there are no, no girls here. They're all gone. Where did they go? Oh, well, they're probably in Germany somewhere. Oh. Back away from 
from the battle. Yeah, they all want to know where the girls were. And where's the cognac and all that? Uh, oh, when we when we were in Cologne, we got this mansion. We were in this mansion on the Rhine River. And uh, somehow or other, the guys found a slab of, of uh, pork. And they were slicing it up as uh, bacon and cutting it in there. And it tastes good. And they also found underneath one of the porches bottles of cologne. And boy, these guys got drunk. <laughs> oh, did they get drunk? They wanted me to drink. I said, oh, no, I'm in battle. I don't want to get drunk. I, Who knows if they counterattack? <laughs> you can't run fast enough. And in, in one of the mansions that we were in, there was a, a, a baby grand piano. And uh, we somehow uh, this one guy found a, a small portable, uh, uh, what do you call it, Victrola. And we found some German records. Uh, the German records were uh, out of uh, plastic, the paper more or less, uh, and they were red. And we put one on there, and it was Hitler's speaking, Hitler's speech. And we took these, sailed them through the window, and, this, and they were sticking in the snow. The snow was about a foot deep, and <laughs> sailed them through the window. I'll see how far they could go. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. And did you have? Yeah, when, when, you, when you got drafted and you had to leave your job at Excello, um, who the, the company must not have been very happy they were losing a good worker. Did they replace you during, for the course of the war, or did they just make do with less people? Well, they, they were replacing them with women. Couldn't find any more men, and they were training women uh, to do the job. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, uh, when I came back, one of the women was my committee woman. Just nobody wanted the job, so she took it. She was a German woman too, with two fingers cut off hmm. before she got that job. Erica Grupp. And I and I talked to her about uh, these Jewish people that uh, were being annihilated. And she she says, "Why did you kill them?" I said, "I didn't kill them. I didn't kill anybody." So she says, "Well, why did the Americans want to kill them?" I said, "They don't like Jews, I guess." A lot of Jews perished. After, after I got wounded, it wasn't very long after that that uh, the um, our group, our division, came across this town where all these German, where all these uh, Jewish prisoners were killed and annihilated. They used to keep sending me literature on all this stuff. But the fellow that was sending the literature, he passed away, and he's a guy that's a lieutenant. He was my lieutenant. He's a, he was in a raft, and he got wounded. Mm -hmm. He got caught, and he was a prisoner of war. I didn't know that until I came back, met him back again in, in the States. Can we tell more about your leg wound? What? Your leg wound. Oh yeah, you had talked about being shot in the leg too. How did that? Well, I was shot. I was laying down at the time. That's the second time I got wounded. I wounded twice the second time. The bullet entered entered just below my knee, down down the side of the leg and into my foot and out the bottom. And when I was in England, the the doctor that was. Uh, taking the stitches off my leg, was I tan. And he was from Wisconsin. He says to me, and I tan, does it hurt? She damn right it hurts. <laughs> and he took the stitches off my arm. I don't know how many stitches I had. Stitches on the bottom of my foot, stitches along the leg, stitches on top of my foot. Didn't seem to bother you though, later on, did it? Well, the only time the leg bothered me was when I was bowling. I'd, my my uh, left leg, I when I throw the ball, I'd balance myself on the left leg. And, and at night, I was in bed, and I'd get leg cramp. 
terrible leak like till I, till I uh, had it broken into. Mm -hmm. After a couple of weeks of bowling, I uh, didn't feel it anymore. It didn't affect my bowling any to speak of. Well, it sounds like you were very fortunate. I think so. Getting shot twice and still coming home. Yeah, you know how close I came to being killed? I could see the trace of bullets coming, and I ducked my head. One, uh, one bullet coming, out and I ducked my head, and the, the dirt would hit my helmet, and it caught me on the left leg. So you can see how far that is from my head. Mm -hmm. And then the other bullet coming this side, got my arm. So two bullets that far apart. In the middle, would be so long now. Wow. It's probably only because the guys in that that were firing were so young. You said that they were kids. Well, the the father, the one that was firing, he was in the twenties. Yeah. The other kids were just helping them out. Yeah. And it just so happened that the gun, that the machine gun that they were using, was an American machine gun that they had captured. Huh. I could hear them locking and loading all the time, but at the time I didn't know it was an American machine gun. The guys that were behind me, they says, we thought you were dead. Hmm. Thank God. My kid says, thank God you weren't dead because now we're here. Right. That's mm -hmm. right. <laughs> Is there anything that you'd like to add to uh, his story? No, he, he covered just about everything. Do you remember most of what he told you? or? He never spoke about the war at all when we were growing up until the grandkids questioned him and now he's just really beginning to talk about it. This will be nice because you'll have a video of it or DVD. It'll maybe stimulate the grandkids to ask more questions and... As long as there's no jokes. When, you know what happened? One thing, when I got out of service I went to visit this doctor to get treated. And uh, he says, uh, write everything down right now while it's fresh in your mind. And, and I, I did. And uh, I can't remember a lot of that stuff. Now I read it and I remember that ever happened. Good idea. Well, it's amazing, but you remembered quite a bit. I'll tell you one other thing I remember. We, we captured this city and they had a, a orphanage there and they had a, a walk-in vault. And in this vault they had German marks in the corner was just as high as that, where that is right there. <coughs> and I went and then I started going through some of those German marks. I knew they weren't any good anymore. And I and I picked some of the marks that were with a, most zeros in it. It was nothing to pick a, a mark with, uh, say, 30 zeros on it at the end of it. Well, I had them. I stuck them in my wallet, some of them, maybe about 10. And uh, I showed them to one of the guys, and the guy says, uh, I'll give you $20 for this. So, <laughs> I mean, I made out like a bandit. <laughs> what did you bring home? Did you bring anything home from Germany? I brought these German marks home. And didn't you bring a lighter? And I brought a, I, I had a cigarette lighter, it looked like a golf ball. And you could fill it up with fluid, and the thing would last for months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then again, they had this uh, place over on Graduate Avenue that uh, were buying German stuff, and, and I, I didn't want it. I didn't smoke. I didn't need it. Mm -hmm. So I sold it to him. I don't know what else. He was buying, they had German flags. He wouldn't even buy German flags. He had so many of them. Mm. Three minutes. If you had a chance, would you do it again? Heck no, no way. And I wouldn't advise anybody to go either. I say, skip, skip the United States and go to Canada. But you still get emails periodically from from the Timberwolf group. What? You still get the emails from the Timberwolf people. Oh yeah, every now and then. You send her the email. The obituary column. <coughs> this is quite thick. There's. 25 pages to this. Well, they get that every 
Six months. Six months. Well, Albert, thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. Well, I give you everything I figure. I thought you did a great job remembering a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. During, before we captured Dern, we were this side of the Royal River. We were in this building, and uh, <coughs> so don't you go up on the second floor because they got stuff stored there that we don't want anybody to touch. So <coughs> I snuck up there one day, and they had tons and tons of uh, sea ration food. Well, I, I scouted some of the food that they had in cans, and it was a uh, uh, Frankfurters and beans, and boy, that uh, sounds pretty good to me. So I got a couple of those cans, and I, and, and I nobody ever, nobody ever found out about it. I had two cans of Frankfurter and beans. They sure tasted good. Hmm. This has probably been the most that you've talked about the war, probably since the war, huh? Oh no. No. No, the kids, the kids. Uh, one Christmas was it? They all gathered around. Grandpa, let talk about the, your war experience. They have a, a certain time that they a, a get interested in this sort of thing. The rest of the time, <laughs> they're not interested. No. And they, they tell them well, they go like this. Sad story. <laughs> <laughs> Sad story. You don't know what Dad, Grandpa had to go through. Oh, one other thing too, in basic training, they feed us, and uh, they they say they have uh, 12 guys at the table, and they put 11 pieces of chicken on the in the plate, and you bring it to the table, and everybody takes a piece out. One guy stays without. Well, uh, that I said that the heck with that noise. So the next time we we did, I says, wait a minute. They bring me 11 pieces. I'm gonna empty them out, and I'll go get some more. Right away. So we got more. One guy was always without. He had to go by, by himself to get the meat. So this way I emptied out the plate. Everybody would help themselves. In the meantime, I'm going over there getting another plate full to make sure everybody got some. It worked out all right. And then after that, the other guys got smart and started doing the same thing. Well, thank you very much, Al, for your your time and effort. I appreciate it. Well, I, I enjoyed it. Good. I hope thank you, you Al. working this time. Very good. <laughs> Most of the um, GIs do remember a lot of the stuff, don't they? Um, you know, it really varies. And for a lot of the World War II vets, um, some of them have put some stuff back so far that it's not coming back anymore. Yeah. Um, but, but we usually get some, some good stories. Yeah. Yeah, I hear.